Welcome to the All of Life podcast from Redemption Church Tempe, where we have conversations on faith, culture, theology, and beyond to help us live all of life, all for Jesus. Let's jump into today's episode. Welcome to the All of Life podcast, where we believe all of life is all for Jesus. My name is John Crawford, and I am joined by some really great people and friends that are a part of this church and really excited. I'm here with Stephen Collins. Hey, hey, hey. Jordan Benesh. Close. Uh, Benesh. There you go. There we go. And Melissa Blakey. Yes. Hi. Good to be here. Yeah. Good to have you guys on here. Uh, So, hey, we are talking about movies today. And specifically, uh, we're going to hit on a a lot of things around movies. We're in this uh, season as a church of worship and wonder. And one of the things that we're pressing into this summer are our summer film nights. And we've been watching some really great movies, having great discussions about film through the lens of the biblical story. And so one of the things that we want to do is just talk about uh, movies today. Talk about the power of film. Talk about even, man, how should we watch movies as Christians? Are there things that... We should be asking before we watch a movie, are there certain movies that are off limits? And we're going to talk about just the power of storytelling that we experience through film. And so what I'd love to do is, um, and I would, I would love to hear uh, all of you guys sitting around the table, what is your favorite movie and why? Mm-hmm. Steven, you and all I right. disagree on movies, so t- yeah, take it away. Okay. I, I'm sure it's not a good answer, so go ahead. <laughs> I love you too. Uh, (laughs) Here's the thing. Uh, Favorite movie and best movie are not the same thing. And so this is favorite movie. So let's preface that. I think your favorite movie needs to be something you can watch over and over again. It's something that should make you laugh, something that should make you move you. This one has an existential reality to it. It breaks the fourth wall. It's funny. Has a couple of my favorite actors, John Cusack, Jack Black. Let's go High Fidelity. Is actually my favorite movie. Wow! Uh, walking through his story, that, yeah, uh, it you know it's something you, I can watch with my wife and we can enjoy, and it moves us closer together. It's something that reflects on music and uh, somebody who's a musician. I love music, and uh, it's got early Jack Black in it. And how could you not enjoy that? So you know what makes you think, hey. makes you laugh. Rewatchability, high fidelity. Let's go. I take back what I said, okay? You're a hey, good man, and that's that's you. a good choice. Okay? You, even got, you even got Marvin Gaye at the very end. Jack Black singing Marvin Gaye. What more could you really want in a movie? Have you read the you book? Know. I have not. And part of the reason I don't want to watch the book totally. is because... Watch I'm, the book? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to read the book. Think of movies. I don't want to read the book. So, like, my favorite book is, like, Lord of the Rings. And I love the movies, but it just can't compete with the book. Mm-hmm. And this is going to be my favorite movie. I don't want the book to like eat it, you know, or something like that. So I'm just going to leave it alone. Mm. High fidelity. Mm. Mm. All right, Jordan, how about you? Ugh, it's a hard question. He's still deciding. It is. Yeah. I'm still deciding. I have <laughs> Jordan I have... is a movie buff. That's why he's on here. He knows so much about film. He's a guy that I love and respect. He's been leading these film nights with us, and uh, yeah, so I'm sure it's hard for you, man. Yeah. So can I start with background uh, of myself as a moviegoer? Yes. Okay. Go there. Cool. Um, so I loved movies since I was a kid. Um, I've got two older siblings, youngest of three, and we had VHS tapes around the house. Um, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jurassic Park, Mm -hmm. E.T., uh, Jaws movies. I was, I was watching as like a five year old because Mm. my brother was older and, (laughs) you know, we, we, we needed to do something. And, and so that's what my parents chose was to, to allow us to watch movies together. And and so that was really formational when we think about Mm you know, worship and wonder and, and creating mm. a, a world. Um, kind of fast forward to today, I still love those types of movies, but I think I've been drawn more and more into personal stories. Hmm. Um, and around 2013, I think it was a really formational movie year for me. Um, I was an, an intern at a company making too much money, not doing enough work and had spare time to go to the movie theater and It was a really formational summer just to engage in different types of movies that I Mm. wasn't as used to. Um, And so I'm going to go with a a trilogy of movies. So I'm going to, I'm going to break the rule a little bit. Um, So 
it's Richard Linklater's before sunrise, before sunset, before midnight. How hipster Love it. of you. Love I it. Know. How hipster those of you. Are, I know. Those are solid movies. I remember um, seeing Ethan the Hawke action young. there, huh? <clears throat> wow. So, so good. So in, in college, I, I wrote my own little movie blog. I contributed a couple of reviews to like East Valley Tribune um, and then wrote for a film website in grad school for a year because I was in grad school and, and had a little downtime, wanted something to do that was different than studying accounting. <laughs> um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crib from my 2013 review uh, to explain why I, I love that trilogy. And, and this was specifically before Midnight, which came out at that time. Hmm. Um, so the movie is about Jesse and Celine, who are, who are two characters who met um, back in 1995 in Vienna. They catch up again nine years later in Paris, and then we catch them again nine years later in Greece. And so we get these little vantage points into their lives. Um, and so what I wrote here is, love is all about imperfections, how we perceive them and how we treat them. Never is that idea more evident than in Before Midnight. Uh, perhaps the greatest testament to what Linklater and company have produced in Before Midnight is that it isn't afraid to consider the consequences of their night in Vienna, their afternoon in Paris, and the years that have passed since. Mm. So when we think about storytelling, we think about characters, we think about life, mm. there are consequences, there are things that happen mm. um, that spur us forward, that pull us backwards, and I think that trilogy really captures that. Man, Good. I told you this guy was a movie buff. Jeez, Steven. Who let this chump on here? This guy is just yeah. Yeah, high fidelity. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was a film minor that's, in college, okay? Calm that's down. That's good, man. At, that's that's really good. At uh, first, I was going to try to vamp for like 50 minutes with uh, like 100 movies that we could just touch on, but I figured cut it down a little bit. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, Melissa, how about you? Yeah, so my background is, yeah, I had a very similar upbringing, Jordan. Um, my, we also had VHS, and my parents had HBO, so they taped, like, everything. We had over 300 VHS tapes with, like, three movies on each. And What's VHS? Some, some, of, these, <laughs> some of these listeners are young. That's before they their time. They are the video uh, Special streaming tapes. device? Yeah, no, no. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, they were the old video cassettes. Like, you had to wait to fast forward. It yeah. wasn't like now. And, um, yeah, I would watch them over and over. Mm. And I think movies from an early age gave me this sense of home. Hmm. Um, I heard about you guys talking about this in the um, podcast about monks. And I, it, it really struck a chord of, like, what does home actually mm. feel like? Mm. And the thing I love so much about movies is that you can go back to them over and over. And you can see, like, different parts of yourself or, like, realize when you watched it last time where you were at. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. can kind of go back and it, it marks time in a way that other mediums don't, I yeah. don't think. Like you can just return to it and be like, oh yeah, that's where I was. And so anyway, I grew up with same. I watched like a ton of 80s movies. I had an older brother and three older boy cousins. So my influences were like Zemeckis, Lucas, Spielberg, same, like all that stuff. Um, but yeah, then I went actually to film camp. My parents needed an excuse to send me away out of the house. So between junior and senior year in high school, I went to Northwestern to a program there called the Cherub Program. Hmm. I don't know why they call it that. And I wasn't a Christian at this time either. So that's kind of interesting. But that program was five weeks away from my parents with kids from all over the country and world, actually. And we just watched movies. And I learned about screenwriting and storytelling and Oh, man, I wrote the darkest stuff. It was really, <laughs> really dark. Wow. But I also learned about film schools, and they said the number one thing you need to do is not apply to a film conservatory. So what did I do? I applied to 10 film conservatories, and, uh, you know, I got in um, to school at USC, um, and I really wanted to go there, but I didn't get into the film school. So hmm. I went to the school hoping I'd get in, figuring I want to end up in Hollywood anyway. So my freshman year, I applied and I ended up getting into the critical studies program. And so it was awesome. Like I was taking classes from amazing screenwriters and wow. film teachers and just four years of film. And they told us like our number one assignment freshman year was to go to the film library that we had and watch 100 movies. So I did. And mm. I just really got formed by them and then fell in love with the classics and everything. But all that to say, my favorite movie happened at a critical time for me, which was um, the fall of 1999. Mm. Uh, it was actually um, American Beauty, yeah. and oh, wow. it's yeah. super dark in a lot of ways. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for everyone, but <laughs> sure. in the years since, I've analyzed it quite a bit and found there's a lot of like ecclesiastical themes in there of mm. you know trying all of these different things and failing, and you know just um, realizing the power of the simple moments of life. 
I feel like this whole Worship and Wonder series we're in is about looking closer. And that is the theme of that movie. Like, can you actually be present in the moment that you are in? Um, and if you've seen that movie, you know, it deals with a character who does try all these different things and ends up like coming up, you know, like blank. And he realizes at the end, which I won't spoil the ending in case I know it's been like a long time. People yeah. should have maybe some time seen to it. Watch. 22 yeah, years. Okay. All right. Yeah. So if it's the broke end... the 20 year mark, I think you can give the spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, at the end, the, the guy, he's tried he's tried girls, he's tried quitting his job, he's tried all the things of the American dream, realized that it's totally failed, and then he ends up getting um, shot. And in the last minutes of his life, he realizes that the things that were the most important were, like, his grandmother's hands and, like, the leaves and the car, color of the car, like, all these simple things that I feel like we take for granted, but... In the biblical narrative, I feel like, you know, we are supposed to be pointed back to being still and like recognizing God's goodness in every little thing. And for that, that movie was like a spiritual experience for me. And I was just becoming a Christian right at that time. So, mm. yeah, that's one of the reasons. I don't know that it's necessarily re rewatchable a ton, like it's deep and dark, but I, yeah. I like it. <laughs> that's, no, that's that's really good. Um, Steven, I realized like you, you mentioned you were a film minor, but what's your background? Yeah, um, yeah with with film. Yeah, uh, like these guys, um, shaped a lot by movies, watched a lot of movies. Um, you know, a really fun memory, going to see summer blockbusters. Our Christmas tradition was that evening, going to see a movie with our whole family. And just the, there's something about the theater mm. that is, and I'd say one of the biggest laments I have of COVID is, is not being able to go to a movie. And yeah. and yeah. and this kind of gets into some of the stuff I know we're going to talk about, but my background in film is realizing how much film has shaped me mm, and shaped my yeah. vision for the world has yeah. shaped uh, my imagination and some of that good and some of that bad. Right. And there's a reality of background film. I wanted to be a movie critic actually, just cause I loved film so much. And, um, I uh, was going to college pursuing that, taking journalism classes and all that. And it actually was being exposed to film that I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a piece about watching. But I said, mm, this, this is not yeah. forming me in healthy ways. And so mm. I, want, I had to, I was like, I can't expose myself to some of the things that this would require me to expose myself to mm. in a consistent basis. So I actually stopped the program, um, got out and got into ministry. <laughs> so I took a different, totally different direction. I didn't want to be a, a film critic anymore, but I had enough credits that I, I can stay, I can say that I'm a film minor. Mm. Somebody still loves movies. You know, um, you still act like a film critic when you talk movies with me because you like to critique my my choice of films. So. I do, I do, I yeah. enjoy it. I enjoy it. Yeah. So uh, my film, my favorite, my favorite movie. I, I have a few, but if I've got to choose one, uh, probably be Interstellar. Mm. Um, and th there's a lot of reasons, but that movie is so powerful, and I, I think you do see. Uh, there's so many echoes of the biblical story with Matthew McConaughey's character. It, it's one of the only movies that I've actually like cried in. There, it's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite movies have uh, like made me cry. There's like a few yeah. movies that actually have I... like stirred me so deeply emotionally yeah. that like totally. I cry. Um, but man, Interstellar with, with he and his daughter Murph, man, it is, oh yeah, there's something even as a dad, like yeah. it's a really long movie, but I think it is cinematically, uh, beautiful. Yeah, I think the awesome. story, it is confusing, especially your first time watching it. I didn't understand what was going on. I was like, dude, this, is, this guy is on something when he wrote this. <laughs> and then you start to realize like, oh, okay. And after watching it the second time, you know, more themes and, and more, I started to understand the story that. It is really beautiful um, of even what he's, what Matthew McConaughey is willing to give up mm. for the sake of rescuing the world, right? And um, and I think there's obviously there's some hints and echoes of the biblical story um, in there, but yeah, I, I love Interstellar. Um, and so one one of the things that I would love to talk about, you know, we have most of you mentioned like, man, there was a time right? Your favorite film marks this time, marks this moment yeah. in your life that it's nostalgic, but it's almost like a milestone um, in uh, what you were going through, where you were, where God had you, a part of what he was doing in your story. And I think there's, there's something about film that makes us love film is that there's a unique power to film. Like, uh, what do you love about film? What makes a good movie? We just talked about our favorite movies and it's hard to even choose a favorite movie because there's so many good films, but 
when we talk about clearly film evokes something in us and there's, there's a power that film has, but um, what do you personally love about film? The ability that film can, can do like evoking emotion, things like that. But even what makes a good movie? What would you, what would you say? Yeah, I think there's many different things that make a great movie. Everything from getting lost in another world mm -hmm. um, to something that challenges your paradigms, maybe in a documentary and exposes you to a reality you wouldn't have been exposed to, to it makes you think a, a good movie can make you laugh, it can make you cry, it can make you angry. Mm. Um, but ultimately, I think a good movie is one that what we believe, you know, it, you know, the Bible tells a story and really like every good movie is a retelling of the biblical story in mm. some way. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, okay. Take, I, I mentioned uh, before the podcast, you know, a dying and rising savior, mm. Gandalf dying and rising, Harry Potter dying and rising. Like this story yeah. has been told before, like, yeah. mm. you know, Marvel people dying and rising. Like mm. this story is not original, but yeah. it, what yeah. makes it powerful. Sacrificial love is the center of the biblical story and every good story is an echo of that or mm. is mm. an echo of things like lament or an echo of things mm. which yeah somebody else speaking to that one that's great yeah i i was just thinking one of my other i wrote my actually my film thesis in school on casablanca i don't know if you guys have seen it but um mm. i think that is the greatest movie it of is all time. a really great movie and it's really cool to have um access to the archives uh we had access so it was really cool like wow. reading through the original letters and stuff yeah. um but i love that movie because it is about sacrifice especially yep. at the end like this guy who's hardened and he's had this hard life and trying to help these people but this love of his life comes back in and he basically has to give her up for the good of the world because she's married to this guy that they thought was dead. And that guy is like this war hero and or he's done all these great things for the cause. And um, Rick, who's played by Humphrey Bogart, like is able to like walk away from her for, mm. to sa sacrifices their love for the good of the world. And that just kind of uh, yeah. chimed. It made me think of that when you chimed in with that. That was, that was good. Yeah. Hmm. Jordan, I am. Um, yeah. What would you say, Jordan? So I mean, Roger Ebert's a, a well-renowned film critic, right? I think, I think <laughs> yeah. most people who like movies know who he is. And he always said that movies are a machine that generates empathy. Mm. Um, yeah. So it allows us to get a vantage point into somebody else's story, whether it's different socioeconomic status, different gender, different race, different period of time, right? Yeah. So we get to engage in somebody else's story from a different point of view than ours. Um, and get a better sense of what that person's life is like, what their struggles are, mm. um, and, and what makes them tick, what makes them the person that they are. And that's what's always drawn me in. Yeah. Um, and then I think you talk too about film as um, a, a medium that is visual. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so music is a great way of telling stories. Writing is a great way of telling stories, books. Um, but Film specifically is visual, so it yes. really does engage all senses. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think it creates, a good movie creates a world, I think like we've said, that pulls you in, um, in a way that you kind of can't escape for the running time of the movie. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah there's, I think what you said is, is so powerful around just the visual nature. Because it's one thing to hear about something, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so what's powerful about film is, and, and in storytelling, a lot of times there is a unique vantage point into the brokenness of the world. Yeah. And it's one thing to hear about brokenness. Yeah. It's yes. another thing to see brokenness, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's yeah. one thing to hear about uh, an abusive relationship. It's another thing to see it play out yeah. on the screen. And, exactly. and there's, and I think that there's something about how the visual and yeah. seeing um, connects with emotion, empathy, like the, the ability to stir in you um, a response, right? And oftentimes it's empathy where uh, I even think about it in real life. If you hear about something, if you hear about a murder, if you see a murder, it, I mean, it's a, it's yeah. a different deal, you know? Totally. And, and I think to your, what you're talking about, Jordan, of like the difference between music and film auditory versus visual there's something really unique about the power of film yeah. um that uh that sets film apart from other yeah. mediums yeah 
Yeah. Um, what what else would you say? What what are some other things that make a great movie? Well, yeah, I was just going to say too the fact that they have such a finite time. I think about mm. now how we're in this age of the golden age of television and people binge watch episodes. Yes. But you have you know hours and hours to get to know these characters. I feel like a good film is character driven, where you yes. can. Mm feel with the character, like you were saying, John, with empathy, with all these different emotions. Like you can go through the movie with the character and you only have like two, three hours, maybe max to kind of do that. And yep. yeah. I love that about movies that, you know, you and, the, and like kind of what I said earlier, you can just keep going back and reliving in those characters' shoes and see what life could be like. Yeah, I think there's something about just art in general, but especially visual art, which film is, is a part of, that art can um art can really stir in us the longing for a better world yes yeah. um the longing for uh beauty like the yes. good true and the beautiful mm -hmm. and i think so much is it can awaken in us as well um a desire for that better world when yeah. you when totally. you see yeah. the brokenness totally. right in film and then you realize like Man, there has to be, there has to be some sort of hope. Yeah. If yeah. if there's not, like, is this all there is to life? Mm -hmm. And I think that to what you're saying about the the power of film, especially tried to like storytelling. But what we say all the time is, we yeah. believe that the Bible is the true story of the world that gives meaning and shape to all yeah. of life. And so, what you had, what I'd love to revisit what you talked about yeah. is about like good stories are are <clears throat> glimpses and echoes of this biblical story. I, I, and reflecting the heart of the God who wrote the story mm. and who's at the center of the story. So if you watch a movie like Detroit, which came out, which, mm. uh, this story about horrible police brutality that happened in the 70s in Detroit, if you watch that and don't get angry, mm. I have questions about, <laughs> about, about you, uh, but there's a sense of it should make you angry mm -hmm. because injustice is something that God gets angry about. And reflects his heart. And then we see all through the Psalms and the biblical story, like the prophets that getting like God is not pleased when people are oppressed, when people are taken advantage. You can watch a documentary about human trafficking and you hmm. should get angry. Yeah. So it's not just an escape to go to, you know, uh Middle Earth or go on an escape to to to, you know, go be with Luke Skywalker or something. Although mm. I think those are like really powerful films, but yeah. there's also mm -hmm. a sense of because uh, people said, this isn't a good movie. It made me mad or it made me sad. And it's actually, I think that deals honestly with our world. Um, mm. So I think that's one element of a, of a powerful good movie that echoes the biblical story is, is uh, coming in harmony with the very heart of God who also, uh, and what we're called to be as a people of God, to lament brokenness, to get angry at injustice, but also to be inspired um, about beauty and goodness as well. Mm. But I, I do want to touch on that, about the idea of like, yeah. brokenness and, and anger. Yeah, I think there's, um, so I don't want to jump too far ahead in our discussion, but yeah. uh, there's a, a great book, Movies Are Prayers by by Josh Larson, who's a co-host of the Film Spotting podcast, which is one of the longest running film podcasts. Hmm. Um, he's an editor at Think Christian. And what he says is movies are not just a story. They can function as a form of prayer to, mm -hmm. to the point that you're making, Stephen, good. of, good. of, um, you know, through the idea of common grace, regardless of whether or not a filmmaker yeah. intends it to be, um, you know, when movies genuinely yearn, when they, um, you know, furiously rage and lament, that is expressing a prayer to God yeah. um, mm -hmm. through the story in a way that is letting God know this is a good or a bad or a painful thing about yes. our world. Um, and so it's it's putting that prayer forward knowingly or not to a God who listens and, and hears our prayers. Um, and and I think that that can be another powerful kind of yeah. way into thinking about and engaging with film. It's really good. Um, yeah, I think one of the things too, just going back to like the, the sacrificial love, right? Um, there's something within every single one of us that makes us say that's beautiful, yeah. right? It's because the true story of the world um, that every single one of us are a part of, whether yeah. you realize it or not, yeah. uh, whether you believe in Jesus, whether you follow him, like this is, there is one true story yes. of yeah. the world. And at the center of that story is sacrificial love. And I think the reason why every single person who watches a movie and you see sacrificial love in it, you say, that's beautiful. Yeah. 
And it's because deep within every single person, they're longing for the kingdom, yeah. um, whether they have language for it or not. Yeah. And it's so interesting that so many filmmakers who don't know Jesus are actually still placing sacrificial love, yeah. some sort of redeemer, some sort of mm. hero that's going to set the wrong right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they don't know Jesus. But it's because everybody says, yes, like we, we want there to be some sort of hope for this yeah. brokenness. And what we believe is, well, that's actually pointing towards this true story that God has already written that we yeah. are wrapped up in. It's just film actually has the ability to awaken that within yes. us to say like, this is why you think that's beautiful because this is who God is yeah. and this is his heart. And with that, like uh, Jordan, you mentioned the idea of like common grace and this idea of all people are made in the image of God. And we have this story written into our hearts. We have God's like way written into us, whether we acknowledge it or not. And I think we can say a good movie champions that story, right. echoes that story, whether the director, screenwriter knows it or not, but a bad movie is one that actually tells uh, a story that would be untrue to that, that would mm. celebrate injustice, that would celebrate things that mm. go contrary to God's way. Um, it, and and so I, not one that, because there are movies that will show, you know, something evil triumphing, but it actually is, it's presenting that as that's wrong though. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not talking about that, but it's actually things that are celebrated that are contrary uh, to the way uh, the world ought to be. And I think that would be an example of a bad movie. And there's also many others that are very bad movies for just because bad <laughs> filmmaking, but bad storytelling yeah. is one that tells a contrary story mm -hmm. to the one that God has, has written. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so I I'm curious because I think, Jordan, what you hit on about movies being prayers, I think for the average person who's watching a movie, they're not thinking about, hey, this movie's a prayer, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that what can be helpful is for us to talk through, like, how do you watch a movie? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're talking about some of these deep things, things that we've noticed in some of our favorite films. And, yeah. and honestly, like, I think if you just ask someone, hey, how do I watch a movie? They're like, well, you maybe, you know, put some microwave popcorn in, you know. <laughs> find a comfy spot a, on the couch and yeah, settle in. Find a comfy spot on the couch, you know, don't, <laughs> don't watch any pirated films. You know, that, that's, yep. that's a federal offense. You know, you get fined $250,000. Like, don't do that. But you literally just turn the TV on and you start watching. Like, yeah. how do you actually, how should we as Christians be watching movies? Like, wh what would your advice be? What are things that you do? Maybe intentional things, um, things you've learned. I mean, you, you guys are, uh, have a lot of experience with film. And I, I think I, I really, really respect you guys in this area around film. And so, yeah, what, what would you say to uh, folks in our congregation, our listeners, how do you watch a movie? Yeah, I would think, um, first of all, I think, Coming in with expectation, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I first watch a movie and I see the credits start rolling or like the yes. logo, there's something like butterflies, you know, yes. you're like, oh, what could this be? What could this mm. be? You know, it's there's something really exciting about it. And um, like, I, I don't know. I also can't watch movies unless I'm paying attention. I cannot have them on in the background. It doesn't work for me. I will automatically get sucked in, even if I've seen it a million times. But um, I think, yeah, going in with an intentionality, like. You know, maybe if if you watch a movie and you're not sure if it's going to be the kind for you, like giving it a chance, first of all, like I always yeah. say, you got to give a movie like a good chance to see mm. if it's going to be good and looking for these characters, looking for God's story. You know, we just yeah. talked at camp, um, All of Life Kids Camp about creation, fall, redemption and restoration. Yep. Like watch the movie looking for those things. A good screenplay has a lot of those things and characters that go yes. through those different things, you know, totally. look for God. It's just like kind of reading a Bible story. Like, where do you see God in this? Where do you see creation? Where do you see fall? You know, <clears throat> those kind of things. Like, that's kind of where I would start. And then, you know, I know we're going to get into what you don't look for, how <laughs> not to watch a movie. But um, yeah, like, I don't know, just expectancy, I think, of trying to find those things is huge. I don't want to be too maybe cerebral with this, but I think about like you read parts of the Bible differently. For example, like I, you read poetry in the Psalms different than you read the history of Acts. Hmm. You, you approach different genres hmm. of literature differently. And obviously all of it's authoritative, uh, you know, an errant, an errant word of God. But there's a, you come at them from a different angle. And I think in the same way I would approach, uh, let's see, the newest Marvel movie that's coming out, like Black Widow or whatever. I'm going to watch that movie differently. And mm. with a different series mm. of questions that I'm and expectations that I'm going to come and read or read, watch like when they see us, like a, the Netflix documentary talking about yeah. 
um, some injustices that have happened in the past. Like I'm coming at those differently and asking a different series of questions. Like I don't think every movie is meant to entertain us. Mm -hmm. Some movies are meant yeah. to in, in, inform us, shape us, mm -hmm. educate us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm probably not going to snuggle up with my wife on a date night and say, let's fire up, you know, Requiem for a Dream, something that's meant to disturb me and shake me. Like, <gasps> but there's, but I might watch, you know, Marvel, the new Star Wars, because that's actually meant to transport me to another world um, and, mm. and echo the build. So I think for me, how I watch a movie, I need to know kind of what genre of movie I'm watching and engaging in. What is this movie trying to even do in me and how is it trying to form me? And I want to find my, my how my expectations are coming into this movie to come into alignment with that. Yeah. Mm. Like, what movie are you watching? Um, will shape how you interpret it, engage with it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really good. I I think um, you know on that same point, like I I try to strike a balance of like having expectations in a particular way, but also not having expectations for like where the story is going to go, mm -hmm. sure. what I'm going to yeah. think about a movie. Um, sure. So I. I try to know something in advance, right? Like what's the, what's the genre? What's the kind of overall theme or feeling yeah. of, of the movie? But like spoilers, I try to avoid, I try to, yeah. not, totally. I try to only watch read. half of a trailer. Yeah. Cause it's going to give away way too much. Or don't read the reviews beforehand. I, yeah. yeah. I mean it, in, in, it depends, right? right? If, if there's something that, and we'll get into this, but if there's something where I'm like, you know, it, it seems like this might not be a movie for me, then maybe I'll read more mm -hmm. um, yeah. beforehand so that I have some sense of, of what's the content in the story? What is the story? Is it something that is, um, you know, good for me to engage with? Um, so it kind of depends a little bit on what the movie is. And I, mm. I think I would also just back up and say like movies can totally entertain. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and yeah. they're intended to entertain. Many of them at least are. Yes. And I, I don't think every movie has to be, you know, thoughtfully and carefully studied um, meticulously yeah. in all of the same ways. So yes. I, I think it can differ on what the story is, but definitely try to go in with some level of expectations on what you're going to see, how, how the movie wants you to engage with it. Um, and then, yeah, try to avoid distractions. Turn off the cell phone if yeah. you can. I think that's become really hard yeah. when we have, you know, mm. get, get on your couch, turn on Netflix or Hulu or whatever the case is. And, and you've scroll got simultaneously. Yeah. yeah, you've got everything at your. That. Yeah. I, I I think we all are right. Yeah. I, it and that's I think a function to some degree of of the world that we live in and the way that we've been shaped by that. But you know, try to avoid the distractions and and actually thoughtfully engage with a with a movie at, um, you know, at, at face value for what it's offering you. And it, you know, I think we can we can not pay enough attention to a movie and say ah that wasn't really for me, but like. Were you actually watching the movie? Mm. Were you were you scrolling? Were you distracted? Were you kind of in and out? Were you playing it in the background? And I think that that can kind of taint our, um, you know, ultimately where we land on whether or not it was a movie that we liked um, or a movie that we thought was thought provoking or entertaining. So yeah, try to try to actually engage with the movie in a meaningful way and um, you know come to it as you are. But um, yeah, I, I I think I think movies can offer a lot. I think that. There are things about movies that that are not good, and we'll talk about ways that movies can shape us and form yeah. us in ways that aren't healthy. Um, but yeah, I, I think coming in with the right expectations and the right mindset can definitely be a, a great way to start. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I, that triggered something for me. It reminded me that um, I learned in school that the first time you see a movie, you really only get 40% of it. Well, mm. And then the second time you get eighty, so it really that's takes. Why I under, that's why I didn't understand Interstellar. <laughs> exactly. I don't think, I don't no. think anyone actually understands Interstellar. <laughs> Still, Christopher Nolan doesn't understand Interstellar. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, just, but I think it's really interesting um, to repeat view. I mean, yeah. I actually make fun mm, of my husband yeah. because he'll watch a movie and then a week later he'll watch it again, and I'm like, I need some break time between watching mm. viewings. But I, I think, yeah, if you're looking for a movie that, like, looking for certain things in a movie, like, oh, I want to watch character development or I want to watch like set design or whatever you can watch a movie and just study that you know it's just like how in the, in the older days you could watch a movie and listen to the commentary it's a totally different mm -hmm. experience than watching it for yourself the first time and yeah. I just also want to touch on the theaters like you were saying Stephen there is something very communal about going to the movie theater I know friends sometimes don't like that but I mm. think it's it's an enriching experience I went to see in the heights a couple weeks ago 
First time mm, I've been in a movie, movie theater in so long. Mm. And it was awesome. Just, I mean, even though people can be kind of like, eh, whatever, a little annoying sometimes. And they might have their phone out, like clapping and like excited and that yes. emotion and going to opening night. I miss oh, those yeah. days of yeah, that. Absolutely. You know? I'm about to make uh, the new Space Jam movie my first, uh, my <laughs> first uh, theater experience, theater it's experience good. It's post good. COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hey, so something that that uh, you all have either explicitly said or you've alluded to is questions, right? Like yeah. the the you should be asking questions, but different types of questions because there's different different types of movies. And um, just for people listening, like what are some questions that you ask when you watch a movie? Like when you're watching a movie, like what are some questions? And I even, I even think. Um, you know, we just, our last uh, summer film night here, yeah. uh, Steven, Jordan, you guys led, was for Minari. Great film. You guys yeah. did an amazing job leading that. I was a part of that. And, um, you know, there were some intentional questions and that you guys wanted to draw out in discussion after the film. Um, but I would just like to to <clears throat> equip people of, okay, well, you're telling me I should ask some questions. Like, what do I ask? Like, yeah. who's the who's the main actor? Is that am I asking that <laughs> or like, what what's the point of this movie? Yeah, yeah. Or where am I looking for deeper things? Yeah. You know, especially if you're saying not all inter- not all movies are for entertainment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd love to hear just from all of you and and even what what type of questions you you ask. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we just got to start with that. Like, this movie will form you. Like, this mm-hmm. movie will form you and. The question not is our movies going to form us, but how are they going to form us? And is it the way, like, are we wanting to be, are we aware of that? The mm. idea of like how much like screen time we're, we're taking in like advertisements are forming us, our social media is inform like all the stuff is forming us to be a certain type of person. Mm. And one thing, John and I, we, we had the same seminary professor, Mike Goheen, and he would talk about his kids. They would watch things and say like, who are you kidding about this? And there was a sense of, they were aware, he was shaping his family to see this is forming me and telling me to be a certain type of person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the question of this movie, like a question that I want to think through with the movie is what vision of life are they presenting? Mm-hmm. Mm. And is it, is it, is it actually um, in harmony with the biblical story or not? And I think that can create really interesting dialogue. And it also helps us uh, not be naively formed and distract us and help us drift away. Mm. Like what vision of life is this presenting? Mm. That's good. Um, what do you think the director is communicating about like, uh, big picture stuff. Like what is, what is right and wrong? What is uh, the good life? What, what is not? Um, I think about uh, some of the questions that we've been doing a long time here at Redemption. Like where do we see glimpses of the goodness of creation? Uh, where does this help me learn and enjoy aspects of culture? You know, where, where does it show brokenness uh, in the world? You know, how is it consistent or inconsistent with the biblical story? Um, where are the echoes and analogies of, of, of Christ? Um, who's the hero of the story? Um, you know, what is this saying uh, about the realities of our world? I think, you know, depending again about the genre we're looking in, these, these are going to be questions that I'm going to want to ask. Not all, I'm not like stopping the movie and assessing this, <laughs> but these are, these are filters at which I look through the world. So if you had to pick, that's a lot of questions. Sure. So I've never asked a question when I watch a movie. If you had yeah. to pick Three questions out of those three. What would you say? It sounds like they're about the vision of life. Like, yeah, yeah. You, I would, I would so definitely you, want to know, like, what what vision of life is being presented here, mm-hmm. and is it in harmony or is it contrary to the vision of life that God gives? And I'd say, what about this? Would I affirm and say mm-hmm. this is good? This is good. This absolutely is. And then, what what things actually are, uh, would I critique and say like this mm-hmm. is unhelpful? Mm-hmm. Like, I'd, I, those are like the big picture questions I'd be asking. That's helpful. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that list that you ran through is great. And, and with the discussion that we had on Minari and that we've had on, on, other, on other movies and film nights, right, is we, we do follow that creation, fall, redemption, restoration yeah. arc of the biblical narrative. And I think what was especially helpful um, with, with film nights, and when we think about movies being communal, like, like Melissa mentioned, um, that communal experience, um, being able to engage in discussion with a group of people or with another person. Yeah. Um, you know, not that, not that individual reflection isn't good. I think it's great. Um, but to be able to engage with other people, because John, you're going to see something different than I'm going to see when totally. I watch a movie, Steven, Melissa, same, we're, we're all going to, we may pick up on some of the same things, but we are not the same person. Yeah. And so we're all going to come in with our own perspective, a different vantage point, and maybe pick out different things. And that's something that was really great about the, the Minari yeah, discussion that, that we amazing. had is, 
you know, it's, it's, it's ping ponging around and people are picking up on, you know, a, a small, um, you know, placement of an object in a scene yeah. and, and how does yes. that connect to another scene later on? And, and I had seen the movie multiple times and I was like, yeah. I didn't even see yeah. that. And I mean, the guy that pointed awesome. it out, I was like, Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And it was like his first time watching it. Yeah. And, and yeah. same, same as you, I, I had seen it three times and I didn't make that connection yeah. and I got invited on this podcast. So, um, you know, I, I, I think to be able to do that in a group and, and think through and discuss those questions, I mm. think is, is really helpful. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think that list is, is a great list. And just to, to consider to the point that we've all been talking about, um, you know, how is this movie trying to form me? Yeah. And then Stephen, what you mentioned of what about this is good? What about this is not good? And I think where we can struggle a bit as Christians perhaps is if something is going to challenge what we think is good, yeah. we immediately turn away and say, mm. no, I can't do it. And, and to some extent, I think that can be a good posture. Yeah. Um, but, but to not just immediately turn from that, I think yeah. can also be helpful so that, um, you know, I, I think our, our belief is strengthened when it's challenged, mm. when yeah. we face doubt, when we face things that are, that are counter <clears throat> and we have to sort of, uh, turn and, and recenter on, on Christ and where is the true center of that story. It's really good, man. It's yeah. really good. Um, yeah, Melissa, what, what, what would you say? I also think you have to kind of consider where you're coming from. Mm. Um, I was just thinking specifically of, you know, when I was, I was single for a lot of years and there were certain movies that I really shouldn't have been watching, mostly mm. from a perspective of I was single and it was glorifying this romanticized version of a relationship. Uh, yeah. You know, mm. a lot of times, yeah, I was in women's groups and they, we were all talking about, well, at the time it was something like Pride and Prejudice or uh, these different, yeah. you know, movies that reemphasized kind of unrealistic characteristics of, you know, males and you know, and, yeah. and it, you bring that in. Yeah. I've had discussions with gals who are like, yeah, I watched this movie or this thing. And it, I brought that into my marriage. And in a lot of yeah. ways, that's sort of a, a sense of like emotional pornography. So yeah. Um, yeah. I think we need to consider our own issues. And I know we'll, we'll talk about this, but just like, what am I bringing to the table? Should I really be watching this? What is my motivation? Am I trying to escape? Am I trying to be entertained? You know, what part of this is, uh, am I bringing to this, you know, just so that we, we think about that a little bit before it's easy to binge watch. It's easy yeah. to watch movies over and over and consume them and not think anything, you know, yeah. but, um, I think we need to consider that before we go into it. Yeah. And totally. it, it totally. almost seems like, uh, just culture in general, uh, wants us to view movies solely as entertainment. Um, because here's the thing that movie makers know, uh, that it is the most powerful, uh, formational vehicle in our society, Mm -hmm. right? The power of visual, the power of you only catch it 40% the first time. How many of us have watched movies? I mean, I think about my kids, how many times they've watched the latest (laughs) Disney movie, cars, Uh, (laughs) cars. like Raya and the last dragon. And it's like your kids memorize lines of the movie they're yeah. acting like characters and now the latest mm. one is luca right these mm-hmm. these yeah, yeah. uh fish boys <laughs> fish, yeah. fish boys and, and, and here's the amazing thing uh my kids our two youngest are in swim lessons right now yeah and literally before luca came out uh beginning of the summer they were horrified of the pool mm. and then luca comes out and they're like we're going to go swim like Luca. And now mm-hmm. they're excited for uh, swim lessons and they're like, they're getting out of the pool and they're like, we're like Luca. And I'm just like, dude, yeah. if this is like what's yeah. happening to a two-year-old, a five-year-old, like, yeah. th- you know, movie makers know this yes. is shaping and forming. And so I think yeah. Yeah. One, one mm-hmm. of the things you just said, Melissa, is the blind consumption where you just yeah. kind of consume. Yeah. And when you view it just solely as entertainment, as a way of like, oh, this isn't forming me. I literally, yeah. I've had a long work week. It's Friday night. We're going to watch a movie and I'm just going to kind of check out and I want to be solely entertained. What you are uh, naively doing mm-hmm. is thinking that is not shaping you and forming you. And so one of the things that I would love to yeah. um, talk about is film as formation. Mm-hmm. Because we did, a, we did something a few years back at our church called The Formed Project, right. which was Uh, What we really wanted to draw people's attention to is you are being shaped and formed into the image of something or someone, whether you believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we are unintentionally shaped 
into the image of something or someone. And the reason why we did that whole form project is we said, hey, we want to focus as a church to be intentionally shaped and formed into the image of Jesus instead of being unintentionally formed into the image of something else. And I think one of the ways that uh, so many of us, the way that we view life, right? How is this shaping my vision of life? What is the good life? How should I think about relationships like what you just talked about or, you know, emotions and, and sexuality and all of these things? Uh, it's been shaped by yeah. years uh, yeah. of, of film. And so I would love to talk about like, where are some of the, where are some of the places, how are some of, um, uh, what are some of the ways that you have seen film not only shape you, but shaping people's yeah. visions of life and the way that they live in our society? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think your romance one is really, really helpful, Melissa. And I, I think about when's the last time you saw a Disney movie where parents were perceived as people you can trust and mm. their authority is something that mm. should be respected yeah. versus <laughs> if you're a child, your your the happiness and the good life will come from breaking free from these oppressive, uh, you know, systems and structures and parents over you. If you could just break free of them, then you'll actually experience the good life. If you can just find your inner truth, live that reality, then you'll finally be free. And there's a kid's yeah. movie version of that. And the same exact story is being told for adults. Mm. That if you just could break free from your boss, if you could just break free mm. from your husband or wife, if you could just move to that new place or do this, new, or mm. just get in touch with who you really are, yeah. then you're going to be free. And then you're going to be able to experience happiness. And like every stinking movie, you can find some of those threads in there yeah. that runs antithetical to actually the good life is being under the right master. Mm. And it's God, obviously, yeah. like it's Jesus. Good. But like, if we're consuming over and over again, you can't trust authority. Yeah. How are you going to approach the Bible? <laughs> That's yeah. supposed to be an authority over you. Like, no, you're the authority is what yeah. movies say over oh, you're the authority. Trust yourself. You're the highest authority, which is just the lie in the garden of Eden. Yeah. Like you can decide what's right and wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a massive one. That's just part of the waters we're swimming in and mm -hmm. postmodernism. But yeah, I, I think that's a massive way that I think we don't realize we're being formed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jordan, yeah, I mean, what would you say? I, if, if talking about, um, you know, the way that movies form us, I think you don't need to go any further than like Halloween, right? Like huh. every kid, um, from, I don't know, one year on up to yeah. When when do kids stop trick or treating? I don't know. 15, 16, <laughs> 18, 25. Grown adults are coming to my door. Yeah. <laughs> but when I'm the like, six month old like, trick or treating, yeah. is that real life Chewbacca? Because you're six five. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if if you want a sense of like what do movies um, and and I guess you could take that to television too, but. Movies shape us in ways where, like, our kids want to be these characters. Yeah, they they want to dress up as them, do what they can mm. do. To your point about about Luca, like, my um, my daughter, she knows Luca, and she knows uh, a Pixar short called Piper, which is mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a, that's about such a, a good one about a bird. She calls it Bird. Um, so those are the <laughs> the two like movie requests that she makes are Bird and Luca. Yeah, um, but I mean, yeah, just the the way that movies form us. Like, look at the way that we the way that we have kids who want to be these characters. And so I think we have to think about that from the perspective of, you know, who is that character? What do they represent <laughs> yeah. um, within yeah. the context of the film? And I guess in the, in the culture at large, like what, what is aspirational and good yeah. um, about that character that, that I think is, mm. is right for them to want to be. And then what isn't. And so that's a, uh, you know, that that's veering away from movies a little bit, but, you know, I think we, we, we often to the point, Melissa, that you were making about like romantic comedies, like we aspire in so many ways to be the character in a movie. Mm -hmm. And so that has shaped us in such a way that, you know, what we're doing is we're not, we're not trying to be formed all of the time by the Bible, by Jesus, by the word, mm -hmm. um, but by the things that we see in culture and what that means within our, I guess I'll call it uh, secular um, cultural context. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean for me in the workplace? What does it mean for me in my social life? What does it mean for me in my romantic life? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's something that we really just have to be cognizant of. If you know that, I think it becomes a little bit easier to um, watch and engage with film in the ways that we're talking about. Without that knowledge, I think, yeah, you, you, you can veer into some really um, unhealthy and, and bad 
ways mm -hmm. by just continually letting film form you um, without knowing that it's trying to do so. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I was just going to say, too, that um, that's good, Jordan. I feel like, yeah, when we watch movies, um, we have to realize that we were talking about masters and, you know, we put ourselves under Jesus and under God and they're always trying to kind of get us to, to think of something else. Kind of like you were saying, Stephen, with this freedom idea and mm. this lie. And um, we have to be aware of that so that we don't do that. You know, I, I was thinking, I, this is kind of why I will have my kids only watch like Daniel Tiger. <laughs> Daniel <laughs> I know Tiger's it's a TV great. show, but I'm like, okay, well, you have to watch this. So you be like Daniel Tiger. Because <laughs> yeah. I know you're yep. going to be formed by this. Daniel but Tiger's neighborhood. Be, be a good go. neighbor. <laughs> Think yeah. of others. Love, Love your sister. Love your brother. It's the tiger version of Mr. Rogers. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Tiger Family Trip is the other oh, movie yeah, that, the third. that my daughter loves. Yeah, that's good. But no, it's interesting, like, even watching Cars with my four-year-old, like, he he suddenly wants to win, and he wants to be first, and you don't know what part of the movie they're going to take away. And same with us. Like, yeah. how many times, like, I was thinking, I was telling Stephen, I think, that I, I unfortunately was shaped by a very, way too young age uh, by Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And it was the first PG-13 rated movie. And I was probably like five or six seeing this movie. And it's the got like human yes. sacrifice, <laughs> like human trafficking, like yeah. Yeah. like this yep. this um, damsel in distress sort of thing. And yeah, yeah. it's like we, we really should think about like what are those tropes in movies, those characters that, you know, we don't necessarily want to emulate or what are they trying to sell us? Like I feel like everything is advertising, right? So what are they trying yeah. to tell us? And and also, I think it helps to know, like, the director or screenwriter's viewpoint on the world. Like, if you've watched a bunch of their movies, can you find their themes that they, they go to? I was thinking about Jaws, actually, John. That shaped an entire generation. Hearing that music, like, made people scared of the water for years. Yeah. And I was really... afraid to go in my swimming pool. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. how's a shark going to come in my swimming pool? But, you know, it's and, like, yeah. Coward. Yeah. Just an absolute yeah. coward. Yeah. <laughs> and Spielberg's ideas of what aliens are. Like, yeah. every movie has kind of followed that, you know, in, in years. But, yeah, they, they were, like, different directors can really shape what we think and how. So. I think about, like, desensitizing us to things that we shouldn't be desensitized to. Yeah. I think oh, yeah. about the way we're formed. Um, I know we're, like, I don't know if you just want to take us there, but there's a sense of, like, uh, I should not be desensitized to certain levels of violence. Like mm -hmm. there's things I yep. like, and now this person's not actually being murdered on the screen, but they're like, there are things that like, I'm just eating popcorn as someone's getting like their throat slit. There's yeah. a sense of like, what's going on in my soul? Yeah. yeah. And there's things like that's forming me or, you know, things that just aren't, aren't entertaining. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yeah. with, with voyeurism and looking at the way that like objectivity happens with women, that these women are seen as, objects to just yeah. feast your eyes on versus this is a human being made in the image of God and certain things with movies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even talking pornography. I'm talking about, you know, movies yeah. and how oh, it's presenting yeah. a vision oh, yeah. of sex. It's like this, this is absolutely forming people to view people a certain way to uh, have expectations about sex and life in yeah. certain ways that just are absolutely destructive to, yeah. to how we view women, to how, uh, we view men to how we view sex to how marriages are formed. I mean, this stuff forms us. Like, yeah. I, know. yeah. I mean, I, I think your example of violence is so good where, where you don't realize, you don't think when you're watching a, a, a really violent film that like, Oh, this is shaping me or this is forming me, but it is desensitizing you because yeah. you're, it's not just the one movie, but right. it's violence after violence yeah. after violence. And yeah, while it's not a real person on the screen, well, guess what? Nowadays, with smartphones, many of us have actually seen someone get killed in real time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've actually seen an image bearer's life be taken from them um, on real live footage. Yeah. And I just wonder, what if none of us had ever seen a violent movie, ever? And we had never seen that kind of violence, and then we saw that. Mm. How much... Uh, because, you know, it, it just goes viral. And mm -hmm. a lot of times we don't even say, am I prepared to watch an image bearer? This is a real person. This is no longer an actor in a movie. Life be taken from them. And it's like, that's that's a, a weighty thing. Yeah. But we, we've been desensitized. And then yeah, that, totally. that transcends into even how you respond in yeah. in our own anger that's in our human hearts yeah. and our sin when someone cuts us off on the freeway. Mm -hmm. And there's... Man, there's you see this violence and this yeah. anger play out in so many movies where it's like, 
you know, yeah. then then it makes you more prone to do that. Yeah. I think totally. the the way in which um, family dynamics play out in so many movies shapes the way that we think through family dynamics. I think Melissa, your your example of dating yeah. and like rom coms. I love romantic comedies. Like I'm a sucker yeah. for them, but. I, <laughs> I, I know that I like chick flicks and, and yeah. I'm okay to say I like chick flicks, but Who I also this know. Guy out here? <laughs> yeah. They're I good. See, he's, going, he's going dangerous. after me. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm with John. I'm oh, yeah. my goodness. Yay. I'm a sucker. Oh, come to my house because we but have to watch know, a lot of action movies. <laughs> I know it's not realistic and I know that yeah. there's a vision, but even then, the way in which sex is played out oh. in a romantic comedy or in some sort of movie, and it's just like it always takes place where it's like it's hot, heavy, boom, where kicking down the door at the end of the night and we're <laughs> ripping each other's clothes off on the kitchen counter. And you're just like, what on earth? Yeah. But that is the norm in movies. And so as you watch one movie after another, yep. after another, it's like, well, this is how it should play out. Yeah. You know? And like, if we rewind the script 50 years ago, that would have been considered pornography. Oh, to- do oh like, for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like you the think Dick about Van the show, yes. you know, it was like sleeping in separate beds. The production code. Like, do you guys ever study the production code in the yep. 1930s? They had this whole thing. I think Catholic we've all Church. studied the production okay, code in the 1930s. <laughs> isn't, that re- isn't that required in like yeah. elementary school? <laughs> or second grade? It should be. No, it actually is really fascinating that they had this code where Catholic priests and different people were speaking into the way movies were made before the rating systems. And Directors would try to like kind of get by and slide by. Um, I think Howard Hughes is one of the first that that did that in this movie called The Outlaw, which I don't, I haven't seen it in a long time, so don't quote me on that. But um, yeah, there is there is a whole thing. You guys should check it out. It's really interesting, like mm. seeing how Hollywood evolved and yeah. the Hollywood ending. Mm. Like if somebody did not get their comeuppance at the end of the movie, then mm-hmm. the, they got rejected, and then the film couldn't go to the office. Like they had they had to, or to the movie theater, they had to do that. Um, yeah. And I was just thinking too, John, what you were saying about violence and desensitization. Like, I remember during September 11th, a lot of people saying that because they had seen movies like Die Hard or Terminator 2 where buildings blow up, that they were just like, oh, they were sort of desensitized to totally. seeing the the plane, you know, hit the building over and over mm. and over. And all the news networks are playing it over and over. And it was like, is this real? Like, we had such a hard time grasping. Is this real? You know? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great example. I think to your point on um, the production code. So I don't know if anyone's seen Hail Caesar. Mm. Yeah, um, by, the, by the Coen Brothers. There's a scene in in that movie where they have like a Catholic priest and a a, a bishop and um, a, a rabbi. You know, different people from different um, religious walks, and they're doing that exact thing where mm. they're looking at what's the content of the movie. Mm-hmm. Does it serve my religion? What is it? Yeah. yeah. So it's just a, a an interesting um, play on on that idea of the production code. Mm. Yeah. 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 I think just, you know, just a word to our listeners, like the importance of naming and realizing that you are being shaped and formed by film. And I think to your, you know, the questions that you shared, Stephen, of like, what vision of life is this giving me? What, what can I affirm, but also what should I be critiquing yeah. and, and mm-hmm. not to just naively watch it as far as, oh, this has no, this won't affect me. It's like, no, it will affect you. Um, yeah. Even if you don't want it to, it will affect you because it's not just one movie that you're seeing it. And I even think about, you know, just the whole sexuality yeah, conversation yeah. on like, there's so many shows now where it's just normal to do like a one night stand. And it's oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, you just have sex with them and, you know, move on. And it's like, that's now like a normal storyline in a lot yeah. of like Netflix show. I mean, I, Mariah and I are watching yeah, yeah. and I'm like, what is this? You yeah. know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and when you just get so inundated with that, it's, it's forming you, but it's also desensitizing you. It's yeah. like, yeah, oh, this is this is a normal part of the human life. Right. I, um, I, I don't know if every single one of those we shouldn't engage with, but at least we need to be sober-minded about engaging yeah. with yeah. them. And I know there's a question of what do we engage with, but because there can be a sense of you watch something, especially I think about like as a dad with young kids, I could watch it with them. And then there's actually a conversation that can happen to say, yeah. you know, this actually would not, why is this actually not true? Or what was good about that? I think there's good conversations there that can help shape. Not yes. everything needs to be some Christian film that mm-hmm. has yeah. this exactly spelled out, but actually totally. we're equipping ourselves and our families to know how to engage in the world where there are contrast stories, to be able to identify those, to be able to walk faithfully within the biblical mm-hmm. story. But I do think there are things that are out of bounds. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that that's a, a great point. And we are sitting here at this table as followers of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that we don't just have to watch movies made by Christians, um, especially because a lot of them 
We're not good. <laughs> if we're just being honest. Um, but uh, what are the things that we should not be watching as Christians? And I think that I want to pose this question because many people have grown up around the church, myself included. Um, it became a legalistic thing mm-hmm. sure. that if you're a Christian, you cannot watch R-rated movies. That was like explicitly stated um, in uh, churches that I was around when I was younger. Um, even if you're over the age of 17, you can't engage in R-rated movies. It's not that you're, you know, nine and you shouldn't be watching an R-rated movie. It's just, hey, this is out of bounds, off limits. You can't do it as a Christian. And it became this very black and white legalistic thing. But I think through the lens of the questions we're asking, realizing that there are echoes, there's glimpses of the biblical story in good stories. Um, but what we know is that not everything yeah. um, is a good story. And so I would say, um, I would love to hear from everyone at the table, what are parameters that you have personally? Um, because I think you, you wanted, uh, you hit on just kind of where you're coming from, the place, your story, which I think is really important. Um, but for you personally, in your homes, uh, what are the parameters that you've set as far as, hey, we, we actually want to um, honor God. We want to be faithful as his people. Um, and so therefore, there, there might be things that we need to say no to and that we need to avoid. What would you say? I think it, I think it really is a matter of, of conscience. I know mm. it, like, mm-hmm. I don't think there's a one size fits all. I don't think that, no, in the realm of like Hollywood films, you know, I, I say that like, obviously there's pornographic films that should be rejected by everyone everywhere. But um, there's a sense with, I think it really matters of the conscience. What is the Holy Spirit dwells in you as a Christian? If you're uncomfortable with something, you feel like this Holy Spirit's prompt, I'd say you shouldn't engage in that, whether mm. it's explicit or not. Um, I think that really matters. Yeah. For me and our family, um, there's probably two genres that we don't really engage much in. Mm. One, uh, more for probably my wife and one more for me. So for my wife, if there's things that uh, are like, especially horror movies that are engaging in, especially like the demonic, we yeah. don't, we don't watch those. Um, yeah. We, sometimes we believe that demons are real, that we fight, fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And we don't want to expose our minds and our hearts to these things. As well as my wife, it just, things like human trafficking or sexual abuse is just not for us is, is just things we don't engage in, that we don't, yeah. we don't watch. For me, um, as a, I will check virtually every movie that's rated R. I'll go check IMDb, Parents Guide, mm. and check, like, is there sexuality and nudity? Because I believe Jesus when he says, like, if you're lusting after someone, you're sinning. And there's a sense of, it's not good for my soul. It's not good for my family if we're watching a bunch of naked people on screens. Like, yeah. I would not, wa- in the same way, I would not walk into someone else's home, into someone's bathroom if they were naked. Like, I'm not going to do that in a film. And so for me, I have set up this. And again, I think there can be matters of conscience. But for me, it's that principle of it's not beneficial. It's not helpful. It's not making me more like Christ. Yep. And so I've set up kind of a hard barrier there of like, mm. I'm, I, if there's stuff in that that seems like, man, that's intentionally trying to make me lust after someone mm. who's not yeah. my spouse. I'm just not going to probably engage in that. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think the, um, the really interesting thing about uh, nudity in movies versus violence, right? There's, there's a difference. Yes. The violence is not actually happening to a human. Nudity, that is a real human on right. screen that is naked. That's and actually so you, naked. You are viewing um, real nudity, um, even in the context of a movie. And so I think yeah. that, you know, to your, and I think that that, that is a helpful thing. Just to, I, I appreciate you naming that because I do think for, some Christians is like, oh, I don't want to be a prude. You know, I don't want to be the, the person that's like, oh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of nudity. And so, I, you know, I, I can, it, it'll be okay. Yeah. But I think for, I think to hear, <clears throat> yeah. like, it's a conscience issue yeah. for you. Yeah. And in order to follow Jesus yeah. faithfully, how the Holy yeah. Spirit has convicted yeah. you, I think it's helpful to name, like, yeah. that's not a prude decision. Even if culture might yeah. say, hey, you know, that's ridiculous. And there's right? a lot of movies I've said no to that I want to watch. Yeah. I like Tarantino. I like Darren Aronofsky. I like. Sam Mendes. I like a lot of directors that have got stuff in it that I've had. I guess I'm not engaging in that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That it's, it has come at a cost of movies. I, I would enjoy. Uh, yeah. I'm sure I would, yeah. but I'm just, mm. I'm just not going to expose myself to that. It's good, man. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Jordan, how about you, man? No, that's, 
that's good. That's really, really good. And I, I do the same thing, right? Go to the, go to the IMDb parents guide, check, you know, what are, what's the different forms of content? Yes. How are those going to shape me? Like try to get a sense of, and this is where I think we were talking earlier. You know, I don't, I don't always want to read reviews of movies before seeing them because I don't want to know where everything is going, but it is helpful. I think there's really good critics out there that, um, that we can read who, can give us a sense of whether or not this is something that's going to be good for me, including content. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think Stephen, what you said too, of like, it, it's a conscience thing. And I think within that nuance is important. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think John, you mentioned we can be very legalistic and say, you know, something R rated can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's nuances within how movies are rated and, and what is going to get a movie an R rating versus a PG 13 rating. And those can be, language yeah. um as opposed to nudity or violence and so yeah. to understand and and think about that and know what is what is going to be healthy for me i think is is good to be intentional about that and reflective on that um you know i think something that's clearly pornographic lots of nudity um something that is exploitative mm -hmm. uh, you know talked about human trafficking and and not that some of those movies can't be beneficial but what is my story what is my weakness what are the things that um you know are going to stir my soul in a way that is not healthy and contributing to my flourishing or the mm -hmm. or the flourishing of my family mm -hmm. um yeah so i i think to think about those things for sure um again you know something clearly pornographic clearly exploitative something that is you know clearly antagonistic of your own worldview in a way that is not um just like challenging, but is clearly, clearly counter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think to consider that. Um, and then one thing I, I did want to mention is uh, Brett McCracken, who was here for yeah, love uh, him. The, He's great. The the, the wisdom, wisdom pyramid, pyramid, yep. pyramid um, first Wednesday a couple of months ago. He wrote a book back in 2013 um, called Gray Matters, and, and mm -hmm. in that he talks about different forms of culture, the ways that they shape us, and how to engage with them as Christians. Um, mm -hmm. So so. Brett McCracken used to be a critic at Christianity Today. He's now a culture editor, editor at um, the Gospel Coalition. Um, and so he outlined kind of this framework, and, and he goes through, you know, the, the ways that we eat food, the mm. ways that we drink mm. or not drink alcohol, uh, the, the ways that we listen to music, and the ways that we watch movies. Mm. Um, and so he, he outlined this framework that I thought is really helpful when we're thinking about conscience. Um, and so he says, um, it's essential that we as Christians recognize that there is a line of too far that exists, and that line is different for everybody. Mm. Yeah. Yes. It would be easy to just avoid art, in this case movies, that are difficult, risque, R-rated, um, but something about the way the world tells us is that art ought to be truthful um, in order to grapple with the darkness of the world. Mm. So I, I think there is a lot of gray when we're talking totally. about... yeah the types of stories and movies that we should engage in. And, and he outlines these five questions that we can consider um, when we're, if, if we're in that point where we're on the fence of, is this a movie that I should watch or shouldn't watch? Mm. And so he, he outlines these five questions. So what is your weakness? So consider your, your own self. Yeah. yeah. What are the weaknesses in your community? You know, whether that's your family, those around you. So considering others, yep. is it beneficial? And I think this is one, uh, along with the next question, has the filmmaker earned the right mm. um, that that we probably have to focus in on a lot in that gray area mm. is is the difficult or challenging content going to outweigh the benefit of me ultimately engaging with that art, uh, watching that film, viewing that story? So I, I think there's mm. movies that that are really dark. I mean, we we talked about um, American Beauty. Is, yeah. is very dark. Another favorite movie of mine is Zodiac by, yeah. by David yeah. Fincher. Really dark movie. Yeah. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff within that film. Um, I think it's really artfully made. I think it's very dark, but at the same time, I think that ultimately the benefit of watching that and engaging with that film outweighed um, you know, some of the difficult content sure. in it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then the, the last one, which he talks about, that he says should be the first, is have you prayed about it? Is it something mm -hmm. that, that if you're on the fence about it, are you trying to make a decision um, out of your own desire or out of God's desire? Yeah. Dude, that's, 
That's great, man. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, we we really respect Brett McCracken, and that's that's really helpful, I think, for people just on, hey, we're not going to be legalistic about it. It's a conscience issue. Pray about it. That's like, what a genius idea, right, as, <laughs> as Christians. Maybe we yeah. should actually ask uh, the Spirit of God what, what he may be leading us to and, and to convict us in our conscience. Um, and, yeah, I think those are really helpful questions. Um, Melissa, what would yeah. you say? Well, I was thinking back to what Paul said um, about how everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for me, a lot of it is I think about do I how would I feel talking to the people in my life about this movie? Like would I want to how like accountability wise, like would I want to tell them that I'm watching this right now? Like would I feel embarrassed? Would I feel like shameful? Not that, that we should just totally go by that, but just like that check in your soul. You know, yeah, like, yeah. I feel like we, we can have that accountability. Like there's certain things I, I have not watched for sure. And, and since I've watched American Beauty, like I have not watched that movie in like 10 years. I feel mm -hmm. like my spirit has become more discerning as I've, you know, grown in my faith. And there's yeah. certain things like I won't, I never saw Wolf on Wall Street because I felt like that was just going to be yeah. one of those situations where I was like, oh, I don't really need to see this. And um, obviously like the Fifty Shades of Grey thing, never really saw that. And as a woman, there was like a ton of pressure to see that movie. Yeah, and I was like, totally. I don't want to see that movie. I don't want to talk about that movie. You know, like, that was just one of those things. Yeah. I was like, oh, no. And horror. I also agree with you, Stephen. I was going to say horror. There's certain movies. Like, I did, uh, I accidentally saw It when I was 10, like the TV version. And yeah. it really screwed me the up. Crazy clowns. Yeah, now you're afraid <laughs> yeah. of clowns. Yeah. I don't blame you. And yeah. just, like, what's under there? Like, what's under, like, the fear that we don't see? Behind, like, yeah, I've been afraid of the dark since then. So, um, yeah, it's. It's interesting. Um, I just feel like having that sense of accountability and community and who, you know, and yeah, if your motivation is I want to watch this because everyone is watching it, like that's not enough. You mm -hmm. know, that's not enough. Yeah. There's got to be more to it than that. Um, and then also, like I touched on earlier with emotional, like emotional pornography, like stories that are going to lead me away from, you know, staying faithful in my marriage or you know, thinking my husband should be this insane pursuer that's just like not realistic. You know, we have, I think women especially have this idea of this spiritual man and it might not even be a spiritual man, but he suddenly gets qualities of like Mr. Darcy and these people from all these different yeah, romantic Mr. comedies. Darcy. Every Matthew <laughs> yeah. McConaughey before he wasn't serious, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Before Interstellar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah before yeah. Interstellar, he flew to outer space. He, <laughs> yeah. left, he left everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we put these people on pedestals and these characters and these ideologies and, and I just feel like, yeah, we have to check. Yeah. We have to check ourselves a little bit. Yeah. There's a reality, but we say all of life is all for Jesus. Yeah. And we also believe that God is omnipresent. And he's everywhere, that Jesus is everywhere. And, you know, they're, they're, you, know, you don't want to get cheesy with it, but there's a sense of we live our whole life before the face of God. Yeah. There's something to be said for, would I engage with this if I knew that, like, Jesus was with me? Mm. And there's a sense of, like, because he is. The Spirit of Christ dwells in you. God is with you always. And yeah. there's something to be said for, like, would I be ashamed, embarrassed, or bashful if, like, Jesus was here, like, like with me watching this? And the, the reality is, like, he is. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. Yeah, Why, yeah. Like just to not live athe functionally atheistic lives that like God is disconnected from this. But if all of life is all for Jesus and the way we consume entertainment, formation, all of this is before the face of God. Yeah. And I think like that's something we, we consider as we go throughout our whole life. The music yeah. we listen to, the films we watch, mm -hmm. the sports we engage, all of it. I think like, right. we do it all before the face of God. Well, yeah. and being, being okay with like turning things off. If they're yeah. not and fasting, I feel like I've known friends who've decided, okay, I really need to step back and fast from movies and entertainment and stuff. Like that's okay, and I feel like we should say that that's okay. You know that yeah. it's okay to step back and take time and realize maybe you're spending more time binging your Netflix movies than you know reading your Bible. And not that you're always going to be reading your Bible constantly, but yeah, being able to step back and be like, this is an issue for me, and what is this really about? What am I trying to avoid right now? Yeah, yeah, I. I think, um, so I, I became a Christian in 2015. Um, and, you know, in, in thinking about what we're all talking about and those questions that I outlined, mm. you know, there's, there's movies to your point. Like, I, I think you said you never saw like The Wolf of Wall Street. Mm. I watched that movie at like a preview screening when it first came out. That was, I think, December, almost Christmas time, 2013. And, you know, if I, if I take that movie through the framework that I outlined, I think... I could see as a Christian, I could see a case to be made to watch it and to not watch it. Mm. And I think we have to have a, a space to some extent too of, it can be okay if, Stephen, you decided to watch a movie that I decided not to watch. Sure. Yeah. 
or or vice versa. And yeah. I, I think that can be totally okay, totally healthy. Um, and like I said, I, I think there's a lot of good critics out there too to read who are looking at this from our same perspective. So I mentioned Brett McCracken, um, Alyssa Wilkinson at Vox. She used to be at Christianity Today. Justin Chang at, at LA Times. Like these, these are all Christian um, film critics who mm. are who are engaging with movies in um, in the same types of ways that we're talking about that can give us a lens into them to be able to help us make some of these decisions that I think can be really difficult. And yeah. and you know we we may not always have the right answer. We may watch something and say, yeah, that wasn't good. Um, and it's it's good to acknowledge that and to say, all right. I learned from that. I'm not going to watch something else like that again. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we can, we can take it a little bit too legalistically, yeah. but at the same time, like there does have to be, you know, if we are people who are guided by Christ and that Christian conscience, like yeah. there does have to be a, a, a line or a stopping point to, for us to say, no, I'm going to avoid that. It's not healthy for, for me and for my Christian walk. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I, I really appreciate you guys giving us a window into kind of the way that you're thinking through this, kind of parameters that you have for yourself, for your family, um, the way you're engaging it. Because what I've heard is that each one of you share um, some common parameters of saying like, hey, yeah, this is this is across the line that we're saying, yeah, we won't watch it. But I've also heard uh, some differences, right? And there's some diversity of, yeah. hey, maybe I actually would watch this and maybe Steven might not, but maybe Melissa would. And what that shows is exactly what you're talking about from McCracken's book and this conscience issue and, hey, everything uh, isn't beneficial, right? I mean, we, we see that in scripture. And so um, just a word to you all who are listening, um, I would say, uh, figure out what those things are for you. Mm -hmm. Um pray through them if you haven't. And I would say, don't be embarrassed. Uh, I think for, a, there, there's a real like peer pressure still with like, mm -hmm. hey, did you see the latest, yeah. you know, did you watch it? And where I see this even more than just movies is it's the latest TV series mm -hmm. that is like yep. the hottest thing that everybody's binge watching and everyone's talking about it. And you're kind of like, oh, I'm the, I'm the prude yeah. that yeah. didn't watch it. And I would say like, you know what, if, if that is how the spirit has convicted you, don't, be don't yeah. be ashamed yeah. and embarrassed yeah. by it and I, I would say like stand firm on that yeah. because there is yeah. i think even a, even you know the the question of like what is good for your community is we could actually cause our brother or sister to stumble and we don't yeah. want to be a stumbling block right but biblically like we're called not to be a stumbling block and so man if i know something about someone who's in my community i'm not going to say hey you really need to watch this is like oh no i know their story mm -hmm. i know maybe what they might be prone to struggle with and wrestle with that Maybe I'm not, and I'm okay to watch it, but mm -hmm. I shouldn't be saying, hey, it's the same thing of like, man, there's been uh, folks who've been in our home that we love who I know have struggled with alcohol and have gone through recovery, and they're sober now, and I always ask them, hey, uh, is it okay if there's alcohol in our fridge? Hey, are, are, are you okay if other people are drinking? Because I want to honor you as yeah. a brother or sister in Christ, and if that's a temptation, like we'll remove the alcohol out of our house and the folks who are going to be there, we won't drink because mm -hmm. we don't want to cause you to stumble. Yeah. And I think the same thing applies to movies, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and so let us love well. Um, and, and just to kind of like tie a bow around this discussion around movies, it's summertime theaters, as we said, theaters are back open. Some of us have gone back to the to the theater um, and we're watching summer blockbusters. There's good films coming back out. Yeah. Um, Man, what would you what would you guys say? Anything just closing remarks to encourage, equip our listeners um, as they are watching movies this summer? Yeah, I think be intentional about it and honor Christ and and just be sober minded with it. I think mm -hmm. the intentionality piece. Yeah, I mean, enjoy them. That's that's what they're for, right? Is is for <laughs> yeah. us to to enjoy and engage with. So so do those things. But yeah, be be sober minded. Be conscious of of the ways that movies are trying to form us and are forming us, mm. um, you know, understand that. And if you can, can go in with that knowledge, I think that gives us a much better um, ability to not be formed um, in as much of a way, but to really truly be able to engage um, with movies. Cause that's, that is for me, it's, it's one of the best 
uh, things about a, a given week is being able to sit down on a Friday night or a Saturday and 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 watch a movie and and be able to engage with it and, and enjoy and discuss. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you guys said it really well. I think um, go into the movie with, yeah, some form of intentionality and, yeah, have fun with it. And also, yeah, don't just go in blindly. Like, don't consume hmm. um, blindly. Like, you're going in, you're paying the money if you go to the theater or, you know, you can decide. You have the power and the freedom to decide what you watch. And and I felt feel very, like, personally convicted after this conversation of, like, hmm, should I, I should really think more about what I watch hmm. and why and it's okay to think those things and it's okay to be countercultural. You know, it's okay yeah. to mm -hmm. go against the grain and don't get FOMO. I have the worst FOMO in the world. Mm. And if I haven't seen something and I want to see it, I'm like, Ugh, if I, yeah, if I have that heart check, listen, listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I have mm. one more. Yeah. Watch a movie and at least have a five minute conversation about it yes. with someone else it's, or even just with yourself. Like yeah, the idea, yeah. like don't just watch it and then do something else. Like yeah. pause for at least a couple minutes of reflection. Talk to yourself for five minutes. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> at least uh, reflect and think <laughs> to yeah. yourself. Yeah. No, Talk with someone else. Think to yourself. Like maybe, reflect on that. Maybe that's good. the the impetus to like sit through the credits. Yes, let, please. Let the credits do that. roll. Yeah. And that can be your th your, your time to, to sit and think discuss. and reflect. That's and amazing. really good. That that's a good word for us to end on. And Steven, Jordan, Melissa, thank you for being on this podcast. You guys are so helpful in thinking through film. Um, and really I, I really respect you guys. And to our listeners, uh, hey, we love you. Until next time, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of the All of Life podcast. To get more information on Redemption Church Tempe, you can download the Redemption Tempe app or you can send an email to tempe at redemptionaz.com.